You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop is made possible in part by grants from Springpoint Partners and the Walton Family Foundation. Waterloop. Hi, this is Travis with Waterloop. Water conservation is very important to me. I bet it is to many of you as well. That's why I have high Sierra showerheads in my house, and I'm really happy that they're a supporter of this podcast. They carry the EPA WaterSense label for efficiency, and they use 40% less water than conventional low-flow showerheads. The model I use runs at only a gallon and a half per minute. And because of their unique nozzle design patented that nobody else has, it maximizes efficiency of water and energy, but doesn't compromise on performance. You still get a very strong shower. Use promo code LOOP20 for 20% off at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. You're in the Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. Joined by Frank Ruiz. He is Salton Sea Program Director with the National Audubon Society. Frank, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for the invite. So the Salton Sea, I have to say that I've never been there, but I've long been fascinated by the place. It seems like it's so unique. Um, For people that aren't familiar with it or haven't been there or would love to hear a little more, could you describe the Salton Sea? Yes, um, the Southern Sea is the largest body of water in California. It is located in Southern California between two counties, Riverside County and Imperial County, only about 45 miles north from the border with Mexico. And it is the largest body of water and probably one of the most important areas for birds along the Pacific Flyway. You know, it's not just kind of your regular body of water. It's really, it's a unique body of water, right? Like what, could you describe, I guess, more about what makes this place so so unique from an environmental standpoint? Absolutely. Well, uh, the Salton Sea is the last iteration of the ancient Kawiya Lake that used to flood this area for eons. Um, so this is a reminder for many people that think of the, this body of water as an accident. Um, the Native American communities that live around the Southern Sea uh, will always tell you that the body has always been here. Uh, and, and it has been part of not only of their history, but also part of their, their culture. Um, but the modern day Southern Sea was formed in 1905 when the newly built canals bringing water to the Imperial County uh, broke off and uh, inundating the Southern Sea Basin for over 18 months. And it created um, what we have now, a body of water that is about 35 miles long by 16 miles wide. It is, um, it is the main stopover for the birds uh, and the wildlife. Um, it has been this way for millennia, uh, providing feeding opportunities, nesting, roosting opportunities for many species. In the past, the Southern Sea used to host over 400 different species. Um, now, uh, our, uh, in our uh, monitoring, uh, last year we found out that that number has been reduced to over just a little bit over 250 species. So the Southern Sea is changing, the ecosystem is rapidly changing, affecting not just you know, the birds and the wildlife, but affecting um, uh, the whole communities that live around this area. Mm. And, and the communities around that area, I'd love to hear kind of about about that what are what's the area like the people that live around there what's the situation yes um most of the communities that live around the southern sea are latino communities i will say 85 percent of those communities are latino and mainly um, uh, farm workers and what is interesting is though that the the area has one of the highest uh, if not the highest um unemployment rates in, in the nation, always fluctuating in the double digits. And it also um, has one of the largest asthma and COPD rates in the state of California. So the communities um, are almost at the margin of um, a huge, not just an economic disaster, 
but a uh, public health and, 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 uh, and environmentally as, as well. So um, a, let me give you a little bit of history of, you know, the Southern Sea. Um, sure. The, the, um, the Southern Sea, uh, when it was formed in 1905, it soon became um, one of the uh, greatest um, stopovers, you know, not just, you know, for the birds, but for the people in Southern California. In the 1950s and the 1960s, um, the, the Southern Sea received more visitors than even the uh, Yosemite National Park itself. Um, and people from all over California wanted to visit, you know, this beautiful place for boating, fishing, recreation opportunities, uh, fine restaurants, uh, golf courses. and it only rivaled the, uh, the amenities of uh, the West Palm Springs. And it, 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 I want to tell you that the Southern Sea also shaped the landscape of, you know, these communities. Um, when the Southern Sea was created, around the Southern Sea, there were many cattle ranches. So many of them were relocated because, you know, the smell and everything else. And, um, and just to give access to a more appealing uh, landscape um, for people to visit. And it created uh, not just uh, economic opportunities, but it created um, a whole uh, cultural um, uh, upbringings. And many people that I meet tell me, oh, uh, by the way, I learned how to um, wayboard and I learned how to swim at the Southern Sea. Um, and the, the, the memories that evoke are, are, are always great. And I've seen some of the pictures, um, the luminaries in Hollywood used to come and, and visit this place because, you know, it was, it was so good. Uh, I've seen pictures of Frank Sinatra and many other uh, luminaries actually uh, having a good time at the sea. And only 60, mo 60 years later, we're dealing with one of the worst environmental and public health crises in modern history. And how how did it happen, right? How you know, and how did it happen this soon? Well, you know, um, for one, I think the Southern Sea is a, is a terminal body of water. That means that it doesn't have no outlets. So basically, uh, the salinity from the Colorado River, the salinity of the uh, fields, because for a long time the Southern Sea has been this um, recipient of all the, uh, the agricultural drains that, uh, that come you know, into the sea uh, with uh, uh, high levels of um, nitrogen and other agricultural uh, residues. So, so it, 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 it created uh, this hyper saline lake. And eventually um, the salinity is spiking to a level where all the fish are dying. And that changes the whole ecosystem. Because, you know, one is like a dominoes effect. It, change, it it affects, you know, one area and it affects everything else. Uh, we are seeing that the uh, fish eating birds are disappearing, uh, such as the pelicans, uh, the cormorants. And at one point, the Salton Sea used to have almost 35% of the, 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 the population of uh, pelicans in North America. So um, and that's how important, you know, this place was. So, so with all these uh, changes in the ecosystem, it is affecting uh, not just, you know, the, the birds and the wildlife, but as it continues to recede, it is um, leaving a lot of the uh, toxic playa behind. The University of California uh, recently released some studies and they were analyzing soil, they were analyzing air, they were putting canisters all around the Southern Sea to understand better um, what are the uh, what is the toxicity of the soil, what is the toxicity of the fumes coming out of the sea, and they found out that there are some heavy metals present in the sediment, such as um, copper, uh, selenium, uh, DDT, and arsenic. So uh, the concern is that. When, when these elements are being exposed, as the, as the, as the uh, lake continues to recede and Playa is being left you know, uh, exposed, uh, the high winds in this region will make all these particles airborne. 
mm. especially uh, PM10, that that has the ability, according to um, some of the studies, not just to um, uh, create more inflammation in, in, in your respiratory system, but, it, but, but even changing your DNA. So this region is already exacerbated by, by these conditions. Um, if, uh, if you talk to many of the community members, it's very common to hear uh, in people complain of nosebleeds, complain of uh, respiratory problems, COPD. Um, so, so as the leak continues to recede, it will only exacerbate these conditions even more. Mm. Wow. That's a, that is a tough situation, not just for the lake, obviously, but the people that live in that area. I mean, this is, this is what we talk about with environmental justice, right? You have these communities, you have high unemployment, and the people around there just being subjected to, to very difficult conditions. Um, what, what's happening now? You know, I know you're, you and your organization are working in the area. I imagine there's others that are working in the, in the area, conservation groups, environmental groups. What's, what's happening? What's, what are people trying to do to address this? What is happening now, is, I think, a response to what happened in 2003. And I'm going to just, you know, um, go back a little bit sure. to give you uh, context. In 2003, the uh, Imperial Irrigation District, known as IID as well, uh, the state of California, the federal government, and other water districts sign an agreement that is called the Quantification Settlement Agreement. And to transfer water from the Imperial County to the areas of uh, LA, San Diego, and the Coachella Valley. The, the, the water transfers exacerbated the water loss at the Southern Sea. And, and, and the, these entities knew that by transferring water, the sea was going to go into um, a whole different stage affecting uh, the wildlife and the communities. So what they did is they decided to create a, a, a mitigation water program, basically putting water, intentionally putting water into the sea until they could find a more sustainable solution for the, for the Southern Sea. And that was in 2003. The mitigation water was extended all the way uh, until 2017. Um, but in the meantime, climate change mm. and uh, irrigation practices uh, started reducing the amount of water going into the sea. And for many years, this region has been largely ignored. I was uh, interviewed by another um, TV station and they were asking me, Frank, um, why is the Southern Seas crisis still lingering after so many years? And my answer to them is this, and, uh, and, and I want to bring it up to you. The communities around the Southern Sea are poor communities. Uh, communities that do not have the social, the economic, or even the political capital to entice uh, decision makers to pay attention to this region. So for years, this problem was largely ignored until 2017 when the water was just about to be shut off. They realized that, okay, we need to do something. And the Southern Sea Management Plan was unveiled by the Brown administration. This plan didn't have no measurable metrics. This plan didn't have no funding mechanism. This, uh, this plan didn't even have the proper staffing to implement this plan on the ground. So obviously, you know, this plan was just um, a little mock-up, right? It wasn't, it didn't have no legs to be implemented on the ground. And it wasn't until the communities, it wasn't until the NGOs and the CBOs, the community-based organizations, uh, it wasn't until some of the local entities working together uh, decided to, to put more pressure on the state who is legally liable to fix, you know, the, the Southern Sea problem. And this administration has been more proactive. Uh, the, the Newsom administration decided to, to be a, 
more uh, mindful of the Salton Sea issue, and they decided to um, um, increase, you know, the number of people working uh, uh, to implement the, the plan. In the beginning, there was only one or two. So now I think this year they are to hire eight new positions. Um, they are they for the first time they broke, broke ground uh, this year, and the first project that is going to be implemented on the ground is called the species species conservation habitat that is aiming to construct over four hundred four thousand acres of uh, habitat, being deep water habitat, shallow habitat. Um, and this is part of the 10-year plan that is also called the Salton Sea Management Plan that is aiming to construct over 29,800 acres of um, uh, control, uh, dust control projects. And half of these projects are supposed to be habitat for the birds. And this is good news. This is good news. Obviously, um, this is not probably what the, um, what the communities around the Salton Sea will like. Mm -hmm. And understandably so. Um, this is uh, the, the plan is not perfect, but I think you know it is the only plan you know, that we have. And Ottoman has been supporting this plan because you know uh, we don't have any other options right now. And there are many other um, proposed solutions out there. And I can tell you at least you know one. Many communities uh, members would love to see. This water, uh, this lake being filled with the water and uh, creating uh, a lot of uh, recreation opportunities and bringing water from the Sea of Cortez, bringing water from uh, the Pacific Ocean. But for someone like myself, you know, that works on the ground and understands, you know, the sociopolitical implications of the, the, the crisis, that understands, you know, the, uh, the ecological issues around the sea. I think, you know, these solutions, although sound very nice and they're very appealing. And as a local guy, I would love to have, you know, this lake full of water. But the reality is completely different. And in 2009, the state of California was looking at some of these proposals. And the cheapest uh, tech price, you know, that was found to bring water from... Um, the Pacific Ocean was about nine billion. Oh boy! The tech price, you know, for the Southern Sea Management Plan is uh, just uh, over five hundred million. Okay, um, I tell people, good luck trying to find nine billion. Yeah. If we have been how we have been having a, a hard time trying to find five hundred million to implement the, the, the ten year plan. And it is not just about the money, Travis. It is about the uh, the, the political muscle. It is about the this is a, this will be a binational issue. Um, and the uh, Sea of Cortez is one of the most pristine ecosystems in the world. Why will Mexico want to give us their good water and take our bad water in return? <laughs> um, so 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 it's very complex. And I use this analogy. Um, uh, you asked me. Um, uh, my background, and I used to be in mental health, and uh, I was a pastor, you know, for many years as well. So I've been around. I've been a chaplain for many uh, uh, law enforcement agencies, and and I use this analogy: uh, creating these, or at least conceiving these wonderful plans, like bringing water from Sea of Cortez or the Pacific Ocean, is like bringing uh, a patient to ER, right, and uh, waiting for the for the for the perfect, you know, plan. We don't have no time. The, the birds are dying. Salinity is spiking. Communities are getting sicker. The, the time is ticking. Mm. We, the clock is ticking. We don't have a lot of time. So, so this plan, the 10-year plan, is, is not the perfect plan. I, I realize it. it. It is lacking many uh, uh, um, variants, and one of them is um, it, 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 they are struggling how to incorporate community amenities such as community access bird watching and many other things you know that will be nice for the communities that live around here the plan is not perfect but it is the only plan that we have and this is one of the reasons why Audubon has a rally behind this plan supporting you know this plan 
uh, and hopefully um, we can establish some wetlands that will have dual purpose, at least, you know, two, maybe more. One is uh, controlling dust. And because, you know, this is a priority for the communities. And I want to say this, you know, um, Travis, um, that once and, foremost, once and foremost, this is a, a human health issue. Okay. Um, and we need, to, we need to look at it, you know, from that perspective. The birds are important, the wildlife are important, and Audubon is really intentional about this. But we need to make sure that the people are protected. And we need to make sure, and this is one of the reasons why, under my leadership, we were able to launch a program that is more comprehensive, that is not just focusing on the birds and the wildlife, that is focusing on environmental justice as well, that is focusing on the uh, public health aspects, that is focusing on education, giving opportunities for the young Latinos and young minorities to have access, you know, to some of the resources. Yeah, and I wanted to talk about that with you a little bit also. You know, you mentioned some of your background working in mental health and and as a chaplain and a pastor and so forth. Um, but you, you also mentioned that you grew up in this area. Um, talk more about your, your background um, and how that allows you to kind of work in education and with the young people in these communities around the Salton Sea? By being um, wearing many hats for a long time, <laughs> it has allowed me to, to see life from a different perspective. Um, and I like to be very dialectic when I approach something. You know, that means, you know, always looking at both sides. And, and I bring those... I bring that paradigm into my work in conservation. I think, you know, that nowadays conservation needs to be done in the context of the communities. Uh, we can no longer uh, afford to parachute programs into communities. Communities already know that um, parachute programs are, are, are useless. We need to be organic in our approach. And this is something, you know, one that I think of, especially uh, uh, as I think of the Southern Sea as a water management issue. Um, I, I, I would love to see a new, a new paradigm. Uh, entities, uh, ag water agencies, uh, all the, uh, the different um, groups and NGOs and, and CBOs coming together and stop working in silos. And the, the, the water issues require not just collaboration, but integration of so many different groups because everyone brings a whole different perspective. Um, I've seen the, the way the water world operates, right? Like uh, you see the, the flooding control folks on one hand, the, uh, you see uh, the the uh, all the folks you know working on the uh, maybe the water um, the wastewater um, treatment folks working over on this end uh, I see the water districts you know working on this other end so water doesn't water doesn't doesn't respect you know the agencies or entities one drop of water doesn't know politics doesn't know economics so so. This is the paradigm that I propose. We need to find the common denominators. We need to find the common grounds. And, and we gotta make sure that we integrate everyone. Uh, just as much as you know, I like to see the water issues from the water basin perspectives, mm -hmm. right? Like the Salton Sea, it, I think is intimately connected to the Colorado River, both hydrologically and politically. And we need to look at it from that perspective. So now that we see the, the water issue from the water basin, not just, you know, from the water district or from the, these isolated communities, we, not, we need to look at all the different um, entities, leaders. We need to make sure that we integrate all the different voices. And this is one of the things um, I was um, recently collaborating with some colleagues for the Water Solution Networks, and we were discussing and interviewing different folks, uh, how to uh, make or how to bring some of those non-traditional voices that have been largely ignored to come to the table, 
such as you know the uh, uh, Native American tribes, right? Um, and but if we start there, I don't think we should stop there. I think you know that we need to integrate many communities, um, especially I'm talking you know now from the South Indian perspective. We have 85% of the Latinos that live around here, but how many are, are really getting engaged? I don't, sometimes I don't even use the word engagement anymore. I like to use the word enfranchisement because, mm. you know, they are so, uh, there's a so left, you know, outside the margins and that traditionally haven't been able to, to really be heard. Um, so I've been intentional uh, in the program, you know, that I lead and with the uh, coalitions, you know, uh, that I participate to one, uh, be more organic, uh, being um, more um, inclusive, and, and 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 also um, trying to enfranchise, you know, the the different uh, uh, leaders, people, um, and and we need to when and we and when we do that, we got to make sure, you know, that we um, that that we go over those boundaries of um, language and culture that sometimes, you know, um, are probably some of the primary barriers, right? So. Um, we need to look at it, and this is, I think, you know, something you know that I bring from uh, my my not just my professional development, but I think you know my my culture and my race. I I don't know if I told you, I identify myself as a Native American by by race, uh, Mexican American by culture, and so I think you know that the time has come where we have to look at it be beyond the traditional approaches and and be more comprehensive, even if, you know, if it is hard for us to understand it. One of the things that I, I liked talking to you about um, when we chatted before is, uh, you know, the young people in the communities around the Salton Sea and why it's important to educate them about about the, the state of the Salton Sea and the environment. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and the work happening in that area. Absolutely. Um, I think traditionally, the um, the disciplines have been working in silos, right? Um, I grew up in a in a, in a whole uh, at a whole different time and age, and and I went to, when I went to school, I didn't see many of the um, available careers you know, or um, majors that I see now, right? Um, now I think, um, regardless of where you come from, regardless of um, what um, um, discipline you come from, whether it is uh, geology or whether it is uh, hydrology or whether it is you know um, uh, public health or communications, I think the um, water has the ability, the water crisis and water issues such as the South Sea crisis uh, can can allow people from many disciplines to collaborate. And I see this, um, before we used to kind of invent ourselves, right? Now, um, I've seen um, hydrogeology um, <laughs> majors. I see, you know, a combination of many diff different disciplines. And my concern, Travis, is that many um, minorities and young Latinos will not be able to be exposed and have access, you know, to many of these uh, opportunities unless we introduce them, you know, to these issues. And uh, I, I run a, a cohort of interns each and every year. And, and my purpose is not to create more environmentalists. My purpose is to create leaders that understand that the time has come to find those common denominators, regardless of what discipline you come from, whether there is communications or economics or public health. And the, the, and the Salton Sea is a perfect example of, you know, that uh, the crisis. It takes all the boxes, right? Um, and, and so this is, you know, the, um, the uh, with these premises, you know, why I develop, you know, these um, education programs. And we also provide education uh, opportunities for high schoolers and we want to make sure that they understand that they're going to be prompted with finding quick solutions. And, and they need to be aware that these issues are, you know, uh, at their backyard. They need to be aware and they need to have the resources to participate. And I tell people, how often do we have uh, a lake 
a body of water that is transitioning from a sweet body of water into a full sailing lake right before the right before their own eyes and the the opportunities for research and education and um, i think are priceless now it is so nice and i think you know uh, and i don't need to be i don't want to be utopic um but i know that the, the, it is a tall order um because you know many people are not used to seeing so many disciplines combined or not used to seeing uh this kind of a new paradigm, a new approach. But I think, you know, the uh, the crisis is calling for it. And, and as human beings, I think we're resilient. And and whenever we need to do something, and when, especially when we are the, uh, at the brink of a, a huge, you know, uh, uh, crisis, such as the Southern Sea, I think we, we find the ways, you know, to make it happen. Mm. I guess my last question, you know, looking forward, looking at the future of the Salton Sea, uh, what do you what do you think it looks like? Do you do you feel optimistic? Uh, yeah, what's what do you see on the horizon? I'm cautiously optimistic, though. Um, I like I I said before, whenever a crisis, um is arriving whenever a crisis is is looking more real i think human beings tend to find the ways you know how to how to find those solutions uh it may I, i'm optimistic that i i will see some of you know those those changes but i may not uh it may not be my generation but just because i may not see it it doesn't. It, it doesn't. It, it becomes less important. Just because I don't see it, doesn't mean you know that my, my efforts are gonna be less. I want to make sure that um, that I put my two cents, and this is one of the reasons why I decided you know uh, to jump into the conservation world. I am. My background is not in conservation. I am not a biologist. I am not a hydrologist. Uh, I'm a shrink, and, and I'm a pastor, you know, and uh, and I study languages, and so. But I do feel that we need to find those common areas, um, and 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 I think you know the time has come for a high level of compromising among the different entities. But sometimes it will not happen until you know they see the real crisis uh, alluding. Um, I think the Southern Sea is already getting to that point. When you see more people getting diagnosed with um, asthma, COPD, when you see those kids um, bleeding, uh, nose uh, bleeding, uh, when you see those families um, struggling, I think you know that it, it is time to really rethink our priorities. Um, climate change is going to continue exacerbating this crisis. And as I said before, the South Sea see just, you know, the uh, tip of the iceberg. Um, the, the water crisis will continue uh, as if for years to come. So how do we find uh, feasible solutions that allow not just, you know, the birds and the wildlife to continue thriving, but uh, also protecting the health and providing economic opportunities for uh, especially uh, for minorities, especially for uh, color communities. How do we do it? I think, you know, that we need to uh, be bought in into the new paradigm. And I always, you know, try to think of, you know, that we need to maintain the balance. I love, you know, the fact, you know, that one, we are growing as a community. Yes, and growing brings a lot of challenges. There's going to be more water consumption. Uh, there is going to be more uh, use of the natural resources. How do we balance it out? How do we create that balance and allow progress to continue at the same time, you know, uh, that we protect uh, the, the, the wildlife, the birds, and the people? Yeah. Well, Frank, like I said in the beginning, I've never been to the Salton Sea, but uh, your this conversation with you has certainly... Uh, painted a lot of, of the picture in my head, and I look forward to getting out there at some point and seeing this uh, in person, meeting you in person, uh, and I really appreciate your time for this episode and all your perspective. Thank you.
Thank you, Travis. You know, looking forward, you know, to um, talking to you soon. And hopefully I'll meet you in person, you know, uh, sometime, you know, in the future. That's right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone, for listening to today's episode. A special thanks to Waterloop supporters, Spring Point Partners, and the Walton Family Foundation. The Waterloop Podcast is sponsored by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart, stylish way to save energy, water, and money while enjoying a powerful shower. Save 20% with promo code WATERLOOP at HighSierraShowerheads.com. If you like Waterloop, please subscribe to the YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on social media and visit Waterloop.org to sign up for updates. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.